Welcome friends to our Wednesday meditation and tonight's conversation with internationally known author, Natalie Goldberg, which I'm looking forward to sharing with you. Uh, this webcast is on my Facebook and YouTube pages and IMCW's as well. I'm recording as I have been for the last few weeks from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. And we'll begin with a meditation I don't teach so frequently but I love it and I practice it regularly in my own life. So I hope you find it valuable. Welcome my friends to our class. We'll begin our meditation and this meditation is a little bit of a different format than some you might be familiar with. Um, you first we'll just set ourselves. You might find a comfortable way of sitting, settling. You might close your eyes And you'll find that through this meditation, I'll be asking you a kind of repeating question. So you can explore that as we go. For now, you might start by taking a nice, full, deep breath. And with the out breath, letting go, letting go. And breathing naturally scanning the body and noticing if there's any obvious areas of tension or tightness and taking a few moments to just let go wherever you feel holding. Be sure to soften in the shoulders and relax the hands and softening the belly, relaxing your heart. Can you imagine the space between your eyes? Can you imagine the space that fills the nostrils? Can you imagine and sense the space that fills the lips? Can you imagine and sense the space that fills the tongue? Can you imagine the space that fills the whole mouth, tongue, gums, teeth, lips? Can you imagine the space that fills the brain? Letting the throat fill the neck. Can you imagine the space that fills the neck? Can you imagine the distance between your shoulders? And can you imagine and sense the space that fills the shoulders? Can you imagine the length and the volume of your arms?
Can you imagine the space that fills your thumb? Can you imagine the space that fills the forefinger? And can you imagine and sense the space between the thumb and the forefinger? Can you imagine the space that fills the middle finger? Can you imagine the space that fills the ring finger? And can you imagine the space that fills the little finger, the pinky? Can you imagine the space that fills all the fingers, the space between? Can you imagine the space between the palms and the back of the hands? Can you imagine the space that fills the whole hand? Can you imagine the space that fills the heart? Can you imagine the distance between either side of the chest? Can you imagine the distance between the breastbone and the spine? Can you imagine and sense the space that fills the whole cavity of the chest? Can you imagine the distance between the sides of your waist? Can you imagine the distance between the belly button and the spine? Can you imagine the space that fills the whole abdominal cavity? Can you imagine the length and the volume of your legs? Can you imagine the space that fills the feet? Can you imagine and sense the space that fills the whole body?
Can you imagine the interior space out of which all the sensations are arising? Can you imagine the space that extends out from your right side beyond the most distant stars. Can you imagine the space that extends from the left side out beyond the most distant stars? Can you imagine the space in front of you extending out beyond the most distant stars. And can you imagine the space behind you extending out beyond the most distant stars? Can you imagine the space in front of you and behind you, extending out beyond the most distant stars. Below you, extending out beyond the most distant stars. And can you imagine the space above you, extending out beyond the most distant stars? And can you imagine that the vastness of outer space and the vastness of inner space are continuous space? Can you imagine that this continuous space is filled with the light of awareness. Can you imagine that this continuous awake space is the space of your being Can you imagine that everything arises and is part of this awake space of being? Can you imagine that everything belongs? Sensations, feelings, sounds, thoughts in this awake, boundless space of being. Can you imagine that this awake space of being holds with tenderness all that arises within it?
Can you imagine resting in the space of your being? Resting and allowing whatever arises to be held with tenderness and care. Can you imagine that everything that's arising right now, sensations, feelings, sounds, thoughts, are arising like waves in the great sea of formless, tender awareness? Can you imagine that everything that's arising is witnessed, 
held in tenderness, like an ocean cradling the waves. So you might take a few long deep breaths and if your eyes are closed, open your eyes, move around, stand if you'd like. I'm gonna share a few announcements for this upcoming week. As as I always say, uh, please do check tarbrock.com for my virtual offerings and imcw.org for live stream offerings made available by our local DC area teachers also check imcw.org for this week's affinity groups. Our teachings and meditations are offered freely, as you know, and your donations really make a difference. Uh, You can find the links in the description and please offer whatever you're able. If you can't afford right now, totally understand. If you can, $10 is great. Or if you can offer more to cover for those who can't, that's quite helpful too. And please know whatever you offer, it's greatly appreciated. Okay, in a few moments, we will move on to our evening's conversation. Welcome, namaste, greetings friends, glad you're with us. So this is a special gathering. I'm having a conversation with Natalie Goldberg and just to say that um, I've only recently, like very recently connected with Natalie personally, but I have loved and admired her from a distance uh, for decades, really actually since the 1990s when I read her book, Writing Down the Bones, many of you have heard of it, it impacted me incredibly. So Natalie's written 15 books and has inspired countless people in how they approach writing and really more fully how they live a spiritual life. So uh, Natalie's also a painter and has practiced Zen for over 40 years and is a wonderful teacher. Uh, She's offered workshops on writing as a practice around the globe. So Natalie, on behalf of our community, a really big heartfelt welcome to you. Thank you. I'm I'm actually thrilled. My little heart is pitter pattering. <laughs> li- likewise, I've known about Tara forever. And I've heard she's a really good teacher, which is so important to me. And that she's a fine meditation teacher and she doesn't skirt around psychology, that she's deeply rooted in it. So the combination is unbeatable. So Yay. I'm very excited. Well, it's fun that this is, we finally get to like intersect and weave these lives. And so I wanted to start by saying that you really have awakened a whole generation of us to the power of writing as a spiritual practice. And and speaking personally, you know, it takes me a really, really long time to complete a book. And you really help me understand that, of course, we have to listen inwardly in order to really be coming from that presence. So I kind of wanted to start here, if that's okay with you, with just writing as a meditation, a a spiritual practice, and just to ask you just to 
share with us what makes it a spiritual practice? Well, you know, we can't all be stuck on the Zafu. Do you call them Zafus in your, you know? Yeah, uh, Christian, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Christian, yeah. yeah. We can't all just be stuck on them all the time. So I used writing as a way to translate the Dharma. But mm -hmm. you can use painting or running or grocery shopping. But okay, I'll come back to writing. Um, writing is about studying the mind and how the mind works. What is your writing equipment? Pen, paper, and the human mind. The more you understand the mind, the better you can work with it. So it just always seemed obvious to me when I used to sit for years and hours, I'm embarrassed almost now how much I've sat and watched. I mean, you know, we just live in this wild domain and how to lasso it and, you know, and channel it and use it and not use it. So, um, and also I think writing keeps you kosher because you can stay on that meditation cushion forever and just drag on. But when you've written, you have to show it. You might, you might just show it to yourself, but it really feeds back and closes the gap between who you think you are and who you are. Mm. So it reflects it back. Whereas um, I think that's important. And really, I frankly think every Dharma person, every human being should read and write. It was so powerful that slaves were forbidden to do it. But it's a human right. Um, my sofa doesn't do it. My table doesn't do it. It's a human right. It's only human beings that write and read. Mm. And I was naive. I wanted um, everyone in the public schools to learn writing practice so that they could be good citizens and know their mind and trust it. Mm. So, you know, your, your teachings continue to be really relevant on this. Like I run into people all the time and I recommend to people all the time for just what you're saying that, that there are so many ways of waking up and that writing is such a natural way of kind of getting mirrored, a mirroring of where we are. And then to keep refining that mirroring and come more and more intimate with what's right here. And I wonder if you might just share a few of the basic tips. Like you do these workshops, people come away so alive with it. What are some basic tips for people that just want to say, okay, I'm going to see what it means to have writing as a practice? Get a cheap notebook, nothing fancy. Because if you're fancy, you get scared. Um, mm -hmm. get it just, I just get spiral notebooks in the pharmacy and uh, CVS usually because they stop smoking at a great expense. They stop selling smoking, anything having to do with smoking. So get a cheap um, spiral notebook and a fast moving pen. <gasps> but Natalie, what about my computer? Leave it alone. What if you're backpacking? You want always to be available. Keep it fundamental. Get a fast writing pen because your mind is always going to be faster than your hand. And then just go. And, and just like meditation, you sit for 20 minutes or a half hour. Well, at the beginning, you might write for 10 minutes. Go. And I really like no topic and just go with your mind. Mm. But people get nervous. So I'll give you a topic I'm thinking of. And every time you get stop, stuck, come back to I'm thinking of and keep your hand going for 10 minutes. Just, it could be just junk, but that junk is your mind. It's all your discursive thinking, yada, yada, yada. Many people don't know they even have that until you start writing. But if you keep writing, the mind will settle. Like shaking up vinegar and oil, the vinegar drops, and the oil becomes clear, but mm. you accept your mind 
wherever it is. And then do another one. I'm not thinking of, mm. and that gets to the underbelly. Mm. That's, that's very simple, but with just that, if you keep practicing, it'll, I'm looking at, I'm not looking at, mm. I remember, mm. I forgot. Mm. So just a, a question about writing and versus computer, because that really struck me. Um, yes, you know, if I go backpacking, I'm not going to have a computer, but also is there something just about the movement of the hand and connecting more physically with your pen and your paper that kind of helps you be more embodied in some way? Yes, I think so, because writing, if you were lucky in school and they taught you penmanship, the pen and the hand, it's all connected. And actually when you were young, learning penmanship, it builds your character. That's why they should not not do it in the schools. It's very important, but okay. But some people are just, Natalie, I have to do computers, especially younger people. Mm -hmm. Okay, watch. It's a different physical activity, yeah. not good or bad, but a slightly different bent of mind comes out. That's okay. But especially if you work and have a job that you use a computer, do handwriting for writing practice because it signals your mind that you're going to a different place. It's so valuable what you're saying, because I notice the different mood I'm in. I get a little regressed when I'm handwriting because it comes from an old era of my life. Well, <laughs> I just don't do handwriting. it very much. But that's exactly right. I want to disrupt my habitual state. And so just sitting in front of a computer and moving my fingers on the keyboard puts me into a certain more left brain state and yeah. writing shifts it. But, you know, some people... I accept it all because, you know, I've had to deal with everything, but there's something else fundamental. You think you're going to have electricity forever. The way things are going, we might not, That's right. you know, your computer might fall apart, but paper and pen, I hope will still be around. <laughs> May it be so. Very fundamental. Don't get fancy sitting. You can do no matter what. So the next step you can write and read. Okay. Mm. okay, so you, I'm thinking fundamental and simple. I want to share, and I'm gonna bring this to the screen, this beautiful book. And this is, uh, I, I want to invite everybody to get, get it as a gift to yourself because um, it's three simple lines, haiku. And can you just, what drew you to haiku? Like, how did that happen? Well, you know, it was in 1976. I studied with Allen Ginsberg at Naropa Institute at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics. And he, in one afternoon, just one afternoon, said, talked about haiku. And maybe I'll just read what he said, because yeah. I think it's, I never forgot it. And actually, the very beginning of this book, follow your inner moonlight, don't hide the madness, Allen Ginsberg. Mm. Now, mm. some of you, I hope everyone knows Allen Ginsberg, but I don't presume. He was a great writer. He wrote Howl, and he was part of the Beat Generation. But here, um, where is it? I just want to read it because it makes it, it's terse. So terse, I can't find it. Um, here it is. Allen Ginsberg, the poet, first introduced me to haiku. There are four great Japanese haiku writers, he declared, holding up a finger for each one as he named them in front of the class in summer 1976. We were at Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Basho, Busan, Isa, and Shiki. No women, I thought. Okay, I'd take the boys on and learn what I could from them. Sure, there were some women hidden in history. He also told us that the formal five syllables, then seven, then five, often taught in Western schools, 
does not necessarily work in English. You know, you've all learned haiku in grammar school, maybe, you know, where you count five, seven, five. In Japanese, each syllable counts. They don't have the, an, that, those articles of speech. So we encouraged us not to worry about the count if we write or translate haiku. Only make sure the three lines make the mind leap. The only real measure of a haiku, Alan told us that one hot July afternoon is upon hearing one, your mind experiences a small sensation of space. He paused. I leaned in, breathless, which is nothing less than God. And I never forgot it. And it took me, I guess, 40 years later to write this book about haiku. And one of my old time students said to me, why didn't you tell us this earlier? I said, things come at the right time. So I went, I went to Japan. I went to the graves, to Basho's grave, to Busan's grave, Shiki's grave, not Issa's yet. And I found women haiku writers. And mm. so it's a, the book's a combination of memoir, travel, and lots of haiku. And me telling you about the stories of these haiku writers is just so inspiring. Amazing stories. And I want to share with you that I plucked that exact quote from your book that, I, that if you weren't going to say it, I was going to say it. Uh -huh. which is basically the only real measure of a haiku is upon hearing one, your mind experiences a small sensation of space, which is nothing less than God. So again, you're studying mind. And at first, sometimes you'll hear a haiku, it'll go like this, huh? Oh, huh? Oh, maybe I should read some so they can... Feel that. Please, I was going to ask you. I'd love you to. Okay. Isa, who you'll die. He's, he's really, the, in Japan, they all love him. He's the most beloved. And, but he lost his mother when he was very young, like before he was five. And so he wrote his first haiku when he was six years old. And I'll read it to you. Come play with me. You, little sparrow, motherless sparrow. Can you feel that? I'll read you a few more, Issa, just because, oh, this one. <laughs> now, you need to know the names of flowers and plants to be writers, and really to wake up and to be meditation people. But listen to this. Sitting on her eggs, the chicken admires the peony. Mm. Sitting on her eggs, the chicken admires the peony. So it's not even human oriented. Yeah. I just want to say you, at some point you say that the spirit of it really is not to be human centered. Yeah. And I thought that was so powerful how all of a sudden I went, wow, that, you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't include this human heart, but it's just not human centered. Yeah. That's we, profound. The relief of yeah. letting go of ourselves. Yeah. And often when I'm having a really hard time, I'll read haiku. Even if the haiku is about suffering, it opens the suffering. And I don't feel isolated with it. And maybe I'll read you this one. Isa had a very tough life. I tell the history in here. I won't go through the whole thing, but he lost all his children. You know, that was a very hard time. We're talking Japan back in the 17th century, 1600s. So he lost all his children and his daughter particularly. He had three children, three. <laughs> and his daughter particularly, he loved. And listen to this haiku. In a dream, my daughter lifts a melon to her soft cheek. I'm going to read it again. In a dream, 
My daughter lifts a melon to her soft cheek. So in his deep suffering, he was also able to empty himself in a way and write about a dream and about his daughter. I'll read you another one. Oh, autumn winds, tell me where I'm bound, which particular hell. He has a great sense of humor and he really knocks you over the head. I mean, I gotta behave myself because I will nonstop read to you about <laughs> Here's one more by Isa, okay? And then I'll, we'll go, we could go on. Who can be a stranger under the cherry blossoms? Mm. Mm. So he had a very tough life and yet he showed up. He became a haiku writer and kept writing. And I do want to say that all of these people did spend some time in a monastery, but they don't identify as Zen. Their practice and their path is the way of haiku. You know, one of my understandings of haiku, and, and I get it that it's not linked to a particular tradition, it's its own, is that it does um, parallel and, and include what in Buddhism are the, the three characteristics of this world, everything's always changing, that there's no central self, no solid self, and the pain or suffering that's inherent when there's any grasping at all. And I love what you said, Natalie, about how even the suffering in a haiku transcends, helps us transcend suffering because in the moments of actually becoming aware of it and naming it and being intimate with it, there's an opening to a larger presence and a shared presence. But I, I'm fascinated by how once I understood those that those three elements were in, in how they were, it's like I could see in every haiku some sense of that that freedom of those three elements. Wow, I never thought of it from that angle, but I definitely know the three marks of existence. Mm -hmm. And yes, for it to really work, it has to have all three or be really aware of it in the deep suffering of our lives. That's terrific. And it comes through in the joy too. The, the joy is still, it's got a, a sense of selflessness and the freedom that comes from impermanence. And yeah, it's- Also the interconnectedness. Exactly. Because yeah. that opens it. You know, our suffering sometimes is because we're tight, you know, because we think we're suffering alone. And it, it's and the separation. Connect. Exactly. And so when you read haiku, it opens it. That's what good literature does. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. why I didn't leave it behind when I was a Zen practitioner. No, it feels like another expression of Zen. Yeah. Of any of any spiritual awakening. Yeah. This is Shiki. Ocean and mountains way beyond 17 syllables. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and Shiki died in his early 30s and he coughed up his first blood when he was 13. He had TB and he always knew he was going to die young. And yet he wrote haiku, not only wrote haiku, he had a whole following. And the last five years, he was in such pain that he would, um, had to be in bed. But every morning he drag himself to the edge of the tatami and sit at the edge and look at the garden and wait to receive a haiku. Mm. I'm telling you, these stories are in there. I, so I'm not telling you all the particulars, but it, it kills you and it's so inspiring. The one that I, I it kills me that I love so much. Um, You go, I stay, two autumns. You go, I stay, two autumns. Mm. Mm. Is it 
valuable to take a moment and make a comment on something. I, I mean, I think the first step is just the stillness, like, oh, what I is just, this? Yeah, I want to make sure that people feel the leap. You know, it's yeah. almost like raise your hand class, anyone. <laughs> But yeah, you want to comment? Sure. And I actually was going to invite yours on and how that how that lives for you, that one, because it's that, really oh, that one. I almost collapsed because, you know, it's like when you're sick, when he can't go places, you can go climbing in the mountains. You go. I stay. Two autumns. That it's autumn now. And you can go. And I have to stay. It says so much. Yeah. I'm sick. I don't go any place. And really, friendship. You know, a friend visits you and they get to go home and you're already home. Oh, that's another way of looking at it. Whoa. That's <laughs> there's so many levels. You know, I um, there's so many levels that often I don't know what I'm writing about. I'm really in it. When you keep your hand going, eventually what you want, writing does writing, and you get out of the way. Yeah. That doesn't mean I'm channeling. I'm just not getting in my way. And so it's, that's exactly I mean, what you just said. I'm just not getting in my way. And sometimes I wonder when we're all busy and stirred up, you described how and what was his name again? The, Shiki. the one, Shiki, Shiki or Isu? Shiki. Shiki. Like yeah. yeah, how he would drag himself and and sit and look at the garden and wait until a haiku appeared. I just wonder whether you also encourage, rather than sitting and just starting to write, the quietness or just gazing or unfocused gazing or just taking in until whatever wants to arise, arises. Yeah, we do that some, but sometimes, you know, when you try to gaze, instead your monkey mind is going crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's much better to do some writing practice to vomit it out. Mm -hmm. And then the sitting is much deeper mm -hmm. and you're not wrestling with yourself as much. Mm. So that's why the writing and sitting is, I, I do whole weeks with more of my longtime students, silent, yeah. like a meditation retreat, yeah. Yeah. but writing is part of it, where, you know, the sitting has been the deepest I've ever sat, because the writing clears your mind. I think of it a little bit also like walking and sitting, that there's something about moving that allows everything to move through you and to find its find its place and then sitting still then there's that deeper settling so in some way you're just allowing things to move through you yeah 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 i think i'm coming out of kick ass japanese direct zen i studied with japanese zen master for 12 years i was 6 blocks away so it was ooh. You know, <laughs> just sitting with the mind till you went out of your mind. So, um, you know, I think, you know, the West became creative with it, you know, like- Which, which feels important. I mean, I'm just listening to uh, all this research that's been done on the brain that we think of it as this computer, but it's really this, you know, organismic material that, it need, we're, we humans are meant to move and that we sit too much and that it's actually when we move that we can then access more creativity and be more yeah. available. So it, yeah, it feels like that's very similar to me to writing, to just engage in the activity to, to physically, start moving it through. Writing is what I say is an athletic activity. Beautiful. It's really athletic, <laughs> You're really moving. But also sometimes I'm walking when I'm stuck. I do a lot of slow walking. Yeah. It's, a, it's powerful. And yeah. actually these haiku writers, every one of them, Basho is the one that's really known for it. And I hope you've all read Journey to the Deep North. He put a backpack on and sometimes went with a companion 
and would walk for six months and with a notebook and he'd write in his journal, journal writing, then haiku, journal writing, haiku. It's called haibun. Mm. And, um, you know, he, everybody, but everybody did it. It's, you go on these walking journey, journeys. Now was the indication walking um, journey to the deep north, which is mm. the translation of Basho's, the deep north indicated the darkness, mm. the uncivilized, the undeveloped. Mm, the you know, wildness, the, yeah. The wildness, your mind. <laughs> That's the beautiful. Wilderness. I mean, every, all, it seems that this is universal, what we're saying, that all the poets, I mean, the, when you look at the biography of most poets, it's walking in the countryside. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. This was very formal as the way of haiku. Yeah. Understood. Exactly. They didn't think you were weird like they do here in this country. It was integrated into the society and understood. And actually, when you talked about the three marks of existence, that is somehow integrated into Japanese society. Mm -hmm. And Harada Roshi, who I write about in here, when he read the book, he doesn't speak English, but I sent it to him. He really wanted it. I overnighted it when I got it. You can imagine to Takayama, Japan, how much it costs. But he wrote, um, my friend who translates for me, he understood the complete book. And I said, you don't speak English. He said, I read what I cannot read. And he, he told Mitsue, he said, I, she got it. She got Japan Zen. And mm. I think what he was meaning is it's in the society. Mm. It's not separate. Mm. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm thinking of this. I mean, the book has a beautiful way of describing your pilgrimage and as a it was you do it as a meditation I mean there's so much just present moment awareness it, it I, you're a good writer <laughs> you know it's really you do it beautifully that's and, the best thing you could say to me <laughs> yeah well I mean I I get moved Thank so you. I have a couple of questions and one is did you plan the book um, before you did this recent journey, like plan, did you plan to do the journey and turn it into a book or did the book come out of the journey? The book came out of, I wrote, I started to write after the first one that I went on the trip with Joan Halifax and Kaz Tanahashi. When I came back, I wrote about 20 pages and then I got cancer. And so I put it aside and while I had cancer, I wrote The Great Spring because I practice. You don't, when you have cancer, you brush your teeth because you do that as a, you know, you do it as a habit. Well, I write. So I wrote a book while I had cancer. When I knew I was going to survive, I wrote another book about cancer. And then when I was done, I went back to what I began before I had cancer. So I could almost say, see, I got to write it. But it was very hard. I, I don't know that I'm writing a book. And mm. so I hoped that the writing was shitty so I wouldn't have to write the book. But I read that <laughs> 20 pages and I thought, oh, it's really good. I got to do it. And I read, I did a lot of research. I read about 50 books. I went to Japan a few times. I had to find their graves because I visit graves of writers and painters that I love. So, sort of an homage to them. And um, I, I didn't know what I was doing till about a month mm. before mm. the book was done. Wow. I had all this writing and I didn't know where it was going. And then I wove it together like a braid. So I, you know, I, I, I have to hang out in don't know mind for a long time when I write a book and it's painful, <laughs> it's hard. It's the hardest, and it shows because it has because it has so much life to it. I mean, it feels so alive and uncontrived. And which this is my other question because I was following you in the book, going to these different grave sites, and it was such a a rich part of um, your communing with with the great masters, you know. And so here's the thing: I was really struck by 
a piece you put in there. It was, you had just visited the grave of Busan and you were back and read, you were just reading some of what he had done back in the hotel. And the message that came through that you shared with us was that the gateway to haiku is what we have inside us and we need to commune with the haiku masters that it's it's a lineage and that you know i just hadn't registered that i had always been an okay just listen deeply inward but that was really powerful so i want to hope you would share with us what that is for you going to these sites and your haiku poet friends long dead and do you have a haiku master if you could just share a little bit about that yeah um Lineage is very important to me, that it doesn't just come from any place. And actually, I'm really pushing it more and more when I teach writing practice, too, that it comes from 2,000 years of watching the mind. It's not some little creative thing. And I think our country particularly is rootless, and we need to go back to our roots, even if they're painful. We need to know the truth of how this country was created. So um, I have that in writing and also with the masters, why I went back. I wanted to begin, who were these people? And I think I wanted to find a lineage of writing that was way back, you know, really old. And um, so I went, Basho was the first one who took, um, it was used mostly, those haiku was used at parties as very funny things and to flirt. And he's the first one who made it a serious practice. I wanted to understand that. And then sure enough, when he died, it went right back to being fun. Then Busan came in. So the people, it was handed to us out of much determination and you know, holding on, you know, not in a bad way, but saying this comes, this is a practice and a lineage. So we're not alone. And all we have to do to be part of that lineage is elbow our way in by practice. And we carry it forward, good or bad. You don't have to be a great haiku writer. They've written thousands of haikus. They're not all good. It's practice. But there's something also about immersing yourself and kind of becoming receptive to the power and beauty of the haikus that have come through the ages, the ones from masters, that that helps in some way link us to that, that ancient and eternal wisdom and beauty. And so I'm, I'm wondering for you, do you have one person you consider? Like, I mean, I know in the past they considered, you know, this is my haiku master and they pick one. You know, do you have one or do you have well, for a, a long four? Time and then one day I write about it in here. I was in a hot springs, my hair dripping and up in northern New Mexico. And I read this haiku and I'll say it. Ah, uh, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. I'll read it, I'll say it again. Ah, grief and sadness. The fishing line trembles in the autumn breeze. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, I was blown out by it. It went all the way down. And I thought, oh, Basho, it was Busan at that moment. I promised myself I would go, when I went to Japan, I would find his grave and thank him. And it took 19 years, but I got there and I found his grave and felt very foolish. You know, here he was, a, he didn't even speak my language. And he was right above Basho's hut. Basho was his great teacher. So Busan, I took on for a long time. Mm. And you don't have to stay with the same one, but study each one and go deeply. Read them, just read them and take them in. Read them and do them. I mean, after reading your book, I just started in. 
I, I, I've had, I've had, a, it's been a true haiku party, you know, in the best of sense. I mean, I find that it doesn't matter how bad they are. It's like if I was in a busy metropolis, just caught up in people scurrying around, so on. And it's like all of a sudden looking up at the sky and remembering it's a bigger world, you know, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. even when they don't work. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I curated about 100 in here so that you have a really good foundation and you can read them and even take off from them, cheat and take off on, from them. That's well, what I learned. You know, when you ride a bike, they usually those training wheels and then you keep pedaling and then the wheels lift off and suddenly you're riding. I love the way you're saying that because that was a bit of the flavor I got from Busan talking about how, you know, immerse yourself and commune with the masters and then they'll disappear. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you really got it. Yeah. yeah it oh, I love that beautiful. one. That really was very beautiful. And I, I do want to say again to those of you who, you know, for this book, the choices that you made, Natalie, on, I mean, there are so many. It was like a, I just kept having to stop. I mean, it took me a long time because I just stopped and go, oh, that one, I, that one, you know? Well, so, I wanted to ask you to share with us a little about your own unfolding in writing haiku. I mean, you described this like oh so human process you went through in Santa Fe with your haiku group there and, you know, the challenges, the triumphs. And I just wanted you to share a little bit about kind of what you've been through. Yeah, it's interesting. People love that chapter, I guess, because I'm such a klutz. I, I didn't know where the book was going. So I thought, well, maybe I should write haiku. I was really interested in studying the masters, but I thought maybe the book's about me writing haiku. Okay. So I started to try to write them and my brain immediately like monkey mind went, this is the stupidest haiku I have ever heard. <laughs> I hate you, Natalie. And I, <laughs> but I knew to keep going. And then I looked up, it turns out, people all over the country and the world are writing haiku. So I found amazingly in Santa Fe, a group that met once a month. So I contacted them and, and they said I could come. And you, you sit there and they, you read a haiku, you go around with no comment. Then you bring another haiku and they comment on it. So I could feel when we went around, I could feel that it was like a dead fish. It was awful, my haiku, but it was okay. And then uh, they commented on the next one. I said, it's okay, you can rip it apart. You can do whatever you want. They cut my throat. <laughs> I loved it because I wasn't good at it. And it was so much fun to not know something. I loved it. I, I, I really fell in love with that group. And time after time, they cut my throat. And I'd think, this one's pretty good. This one will do it. Then I'd bring it in and you could, they didn't even have to comment. I could hear by reading <laughs> it that it was like, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then finally, one word. I was ready to just, I acted very tray casual. <laughs> Inside, I wanted to do leaps around the room. I was so excited. I was so excited. And I became very fond of everyone. And I write about them. And then some of them would bring haiku that you would die from. They were so good. Like, wow. And I realized they didn't know how good they were. You know, because there's always a gap. And I'd say, pull them aside later and say, that was fantastic. And I'd say, Really? Mm. And these were like very practiced haiku writers. We all have gaps. Yeah. Mm. And it just, you're reminding me of the power of practicing together. Yes. And this, and I mean it on all levels. I mean, whether it's haiku writing or sharing our joys or sorrows, it's like it, we enter a bigger world, a more yeah. intelligent, and true world when we are sharing with others. Other, we're in a kind of cocoon otherwise, you know? Yes, and even though you're alone writing, to be connected 
to realizing it's in a lineage and you're really writing with many people. Or you're sitting. I sit alone a lot now because of COVID. I usually sit outside because then I'm all with the trees and the ground. I'm just there. Even in the cold, I sit outside. I just wrap up and sit outside. But um, yeah, it, otherwise it's too lonely and isolating and funk, you don't get anything. And it's not the truth of what we are. We, we do belong to the trees and the earth and each other. And yeah. so, we're, so when we're in our true belonging, there's going to be a flow. I mean, it's like yeah. kind of like the intelligence of the universe can flow through us. And also haiku writing is a communal act. You know, the Basho hut that I told you about where Busan was buried above it, his disciples, it was a dirt, it was just a dirt pile. They came and rebuilt it, Basho's hut. And mm -hmm. they vowed once a year on a weekend to come and drink sake and write haiku all weekend. Mm -hmm. So people write haiku. It's a very communal act. I love that. I love that. So something you said earlier, I just wanted to loop back to, which was about the, the syllable. It, it's three simple lines. It doesn't necessarily have to be the 575. Five. Can you just say a little more about how the structure can serve, but also can get in the way? Because you, you had one line, which is something about, you know, if I only cared about the syllables, I'd have a block of words with no soul. And I, I love that. Yeah. And there's also some value to, I mean, I find it useful to have some container too. So just to speak to that a little. Yeah. Um, well, in Japan, they do do five, seven, five, but each syllable has tremendous weight. We have a, uh, the, that doesn't have a lot of weight. So you could practice five, seven, five, which is very good. But you can also know that more than that is three short lines. But then you think, well, what's three short lines? What, how, what makes it a haiku? It's that it has that leap, mm -hmm. that leap when the mind hears it. Mm -hmm. So, um, and sometimes when you do it, you don't know there's a leap till later on. So sometimes I'll write 10. I'll say, okay, Nat, go, 10 haiku. And maybe, Three months later, I'll look at them after the blood has dried. <laughs> I can see that one works. Yeah. So I'm telling you that because don't expect, don't get tied around it. And so, and you can float between the two syllables because mm -hmm. I'll write and not count syllables, but I'll make sure that it's in a range. I don't write 15 syllables in one line. You know, it might be seven eight, seven, you know, I, I'm flexible, but not, it does have a certain, you know, form. And, and the form is, even if you're off by a syllable or two, is it still that there's five, seven, five, or six, eight, six, or five, six, five, is it still got that shape to it where the middle line is longer? Yeah. I'd say yeah. yes, yeah. Why don't you try for that? Yeah, try for that. But I could, you know, it's funny because the translations don't have 575. Mm -hmm. In order to really communicate it, the translator might couldn't cling to that in English. Yeah, that's important. That's really yeah. important because we tend to be kind of uh, rigid and I kind of wanted to get a feeling from you of where the fluidity is and also what a wise container is. So that's, that's, that's softness. softness. Just a yeah. softness. Yeah. Not flabby, soft. <laughs> well, maybe you could just say a little bit about what you've noticed, just the way practice always keeps evolving. What's a kind of cutting edge or place of evolving for you in current days? Well, that is quite a question. I've been burning for 35 years. Bones came out 35 years ago and I've gone nonstop. I've written 15 books. When I wasn't teaching, I was writing a book. I was continue under all circumstances. Don't be tossed away. 
make positive effort for the good. COVID came and it all collapsed. Wow. And I sat in my backyard, who am I? Mm -hmm. I have not, and for the first time, I had nothing more to write. Mm -hmm. And I used to complain, why do I have to write another book? But when I didn't have a book to write, that's my real practice mm -hmm. that really makes me face myself. And I didn't have anything. I sat, you know, I was dutiful. I sat, but things really collapsed. The country collapsed for me. I was guided. I didn't realize my grandfather was a Jew who ran from pogroms in the early 1900s. So he always would say, he li we lived with him. Natalie, you don't know how wonderful this country is. And for him, it was. Mm. And so underneath, that's why I'm out in the West. Mm. I wanted to be in the gorgeous country. Mm. And, you know, I've always known about uh, slavery and I've had a, um, a you know, a um, scholarship program for people of color for 35 years. We always read people of color. I knew all this, but like everything was stripped. Mm -hmm. I felt betrayed. I, I felt like we were living in a, a house that was about to collapse. Mm -hmm. Everything. And mm -hmm. how could I write? What did I have to write about? So it was very painful time. And I'm facing that now. And I'm a little embarrassed, but I'll tell you, I drove up to the place I thought I would never go, Ketchum, Idaho. Do you know what's in Ketchum, Idaho, Tara? There's something familiar about it. So tell me. Hemingway's grave, mm. Ernest Hemingway. I wouldn't have known that. He was an early teacher of mine, mentor. I didn't know him, but uh, Movable Feast, for instance, mm. Death in the Afternoon, and um, he had an awful life, really, and uh, Mer killed himself in Ketchum, Idaho, and is buried there. And I found his grave, and I sat by it, and I talked to him, and talked and talked. And I realized, Matt, this is your path. You're a writer. And I know you want to quit now. You want to find something else. But it's the only thing. You made a vow somehow, someplace, you will continue. So I'm facing into that, but not with the mojo I had for 35 years. Mm. And friends say to me, well, welcome, Natalie. Now you know how other writers feel. But I always have this third foot, you know, the Dharma. So it helps. Mm. But um, Everything's been torn from me, it feels like. Everything. My great love of New Mexico. It's a good place. Mm. You know, it, just everything mm. has been torn from me. So I'm in there. I want to thank you. Um, there's always something really precious when there's a sharing that's not, you know, that was, that was last year, but here's what I've figured out even though you, you, there's something that's evolved, there's some place in you that knows this, your path is to keep writing, that you're still in that, the rawness of the uncertainty of the ripped awayness. And so I'm pausing here for a moment, friends, just to let you know that I lost my internet connection right at this moment of responding to Natalie's uh, powerful personal sharing, which is really interesting because everything got cut off and just living with that energy. Uh, but I'm continuing now. And uh, yeah, so Natalie, as I listened, I, I felt you, like you were reporting something that's actually happening to so many of us, which sometimes maybe is the job of a, of a writer um, to report out. And, and I think it's something that maybe we haven't recognized so clearly, which is that on some level, we've all been stopped in our tracks. Um, that, you know, that we're, we're going along, you know, of course, to some degree on autopilot, 
and then this the magnitude of what's happening to our our larger body the earth has really pierced through our consciousness um, the suffering of the pandemic just completely cracked things open the the ongoing violating and oppression of 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 black people you know it's it's piercing through and as you said it tears apart the foundations of, of how we've held the world and it's it's painful and it just seems that each in our own way we all need to be stopped in our tracks to listen and reconsider in a way how do i want to live my life you know what really matters you know how, how else can we respond to this precious struggling world that we don't stop and listen and i think that includes what you described just living in that rawness and uncertainty yeah so in in the spirit of the pausing and the stopping um i'd, I'd love to have you share whatever final message you have for us and also some haiku to kind of end on that note well yeah, I think in my, you know, searching, you know, trying to grab something, I think when I went to Hemingway's grave, what I realized was I'm a writer and that, yeah, Nat, get out of the way, you're white, you may, what do you have to say, all of that, but Nat, continue practicing, don't stop practicing, keep doing it. And actually Hemingway wrote, a memorable, a movable feast right before he committed suicide. So he was in tremendous agony. You know, he's not really a model for us, but he continued. And that is important to me. But yes, I think that um, we're blown out. We're blown out. <laughs> Our foundation, everything. And to admit that, is helpful because you don't feel so crazy that, oh, you too, you too, that it's really happening. And we're not alone in it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah. And what's dawning on me, Matt, write about COVID, write about what's happening. You know, I, I thought I had to skirt it or something, but that's all that's happening now, not just in the US, all over the world. The suffering, it's unbearable to hear the news. Just the news is, I don't know if I've been ripped open or it's worse than I've ever heard it. So why don't we, with that, I'll do a few more haiku. Mm, <laughs> like, love which, like I said before, I go to, to give, bring me to another world or to this world you know, in a deeper way. Yeah. So I, I realize I have to read you this one, which Katagiri Roshi used to recite. And it's by Basho. Remember, I told you that he'd go on these long journeys walking. And he went to Matsushima. And when he got there, he never wrote this down. It's oral, and it's passed on generation to generation. Matsushima Ah, Matsushima, ah, ah, Matsushima, ah, Matsushima. I mean, there was nothing to say, it was so beautiful. In my mind, it was always a huge, beautiful mountain. I went there, I went on a Basho walking tour. It's an archipelago. It's not a mountain. All these years, I said, this is Matsushima. And it was beautiful. But it took me a minute to turn from what I thought it was. Mm. So I thought um, I would end. I would read, if I can find them, which you think I would have right here, some Chioni, which is a woman haiku writer that I found. And this one, I'm gonna read you this one or recite it, if I can remember it. This was an expression of a moment that she had an awakening. And so she wrote a haiku. Now, 
I love this one. I'm going to say it twice because I want you to take it in. Clear water, no front, no back. Clear water, no front, no back. So here's one when she aged. My energy can only defeat a butterfly this spring morning. And just a few little sexy ones that she, so to tell you, we'll leave with a few sexy things. Is not sex life. And, <laughs> um, <laughs> and that you can tell it's different than the men's writing, the four men that I read. Not good, not better or worse, just slightly different. Till his hat fades into a butterfly, I yearned for him. Till his hat fades into a butterfly, I yearned for him. Here's another. Woman's desire, deeply rooted, a wild violet. And here, morning glory. The truth is, the flower hates people. <laughs> morning glory. The truth is, the flower hates people. It, maybe I shouldn't leave with that, but oh, this was her one. You know, haiku writers on their deathbed, they write a haiku. Here was one of hers, she wrote several. So maybe we'll end with this. I also saw the moon as for this world, ah, goodbye. Mm. Read it again. I also saw the moon as for this world, ah, goodbye. Mm. Whole worlds in three lines. Yeah, I'm listening and feeling like how these move us in ways that, at least for me, my mind can't get it. It's it's almost this energetic. <laughs> you feel the space. Yeah. You, there's, yeah, yeah. There's not there's not like a cognitive grasping, you know. Yeah, you can't. It just yeah, it's just a it's just a, a mood that takes over with each one. Yeah. Thank you, dear Annette. What a Thank pleasure. You. Oh my gosh, for all you've shared with us. And, and I want to thank all of you who are watching, listening, part of this. Um, wish each and every one of you deepest namaste and blessings. <laughs>